Welcome to Book Talk. I'm Rachel Edge, filling in for Leo Sabalski, and here with me I have Shirley Smith Matheson, a very popular and uh, wonderful author and historian that's actually from the piece. You're from Ho Hudson Hope, correct? Yes, that's correct. Wonderful. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Awesome. So let's get the ball rolling. Um, what are you doing this week? Why are you back up in the Peace Region? It's my annual pilgrimage. Uh, I have come up every year since we first lived here in the 1960s and uh, when my husband worked on the WAC Bennett Dam and I worked for the district and then we also both worked on the second dam, Peace Canyon and so now with Site C happening um, I come up for the paddle for the peace. It's basically a protest and also an information weekend to tell people who aren't familiar with Site C what it's all about and uh, it's just a wonderful gathering with a sadness to it too. Oh, fair enough. Well, speaking of the Site C, like, what do you what do you tell people about Site C? Because I believe you're on the other side of it that you're not for it, right? As an author, uh, I want to tell a story and let the readers decide. I try to tell everything uh, that's possible for me to relate. I'm in contact with Dave Conway, who is a spokesperson for BC Hydro. And if I have questions, I forward them to him, and he his responses are what I can report. So uh, the reader makes the decision. Well, that's wonderful that you give both sides. It's not just like a one. You can't kind of have thing. a diatribe against BC Hydro against it because then you're only talking to the choir or preaching to the choir, and it doesn't work that way because n people who think oh she doesn't want you know, the dam to go ahead, why should they read it? But they're going to find the story, and then they can decide. Perfect. That's that's a great way to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, so what are you, like, are you planning to see anybody while you're in the region, or? Yes, I've uh, seen a number of people. I came up a year ago and did a lot of interviews of local people uh, whose land is very much being affected by Site C Dam, by the reservoir, and as well as the realignment of Highway 29. In fact, this morning, I accompanied um, some people who are um, experts on plant life who had been hired by BC Hydro as contractors to check to see how many rare plants are f to be found on this piece of property. And there were a couple, uh, there always is, uh, but they were looking for lichen as well. And so I followed them around and it was very interesting. They, they don't have a, an opinion, it's a job for them. They're, they're scientists they're, and that's respected. So I will definitely see people at the gathering uh, for the Paddle for the Peace. I hope to paddle again this year with some people. Wonderful. Last year I did, and it was, takes an hour and a half. We put in the boats at the Halfway River and it takes that time to paddle down to Bear Flat and you really see the river from the middle of the river and it's just awe-inspiring. Wonderful. So how long have you been doing the Paddle for the Peace? I prob This is probably sixth or eighth year that I have g come up for this specifically. Wow. So you travel up from Calgary like yeah. as often as possible then for that? Once, well, once a year, yeah. yes, indeed. And we stay five days. And my husband was born in Peace River Town, so oh, he's nice. a Peace River boy. <laughs> and uh, so we lived here, as I said, in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. That's when Site C was uh, thought of in the 80s, and we were landowners on the uh, banks of the Peace, so we all protested mightily. And it was cancelled or postponed, I guess we shall say. Nothing with an engineer is ever cancelled. That's true. That is very true. Um, so let's get into your writing. Um, mm -hmm. Have you been doing anything for writing lately? Any new novels? Anything that people can look forward to? Well, hopefully. Uh, the new book is coming out, uh, the new edition of This Was Our Valley, which brings it, it up to the present time. Uh, but also, I write young adult novels. Perfect. And I can see a few of them here that I've written. Uh, I have a new one that is being worked on. I have an agent interested, and we are. Um, going to see how it, how it goes. I'm part way through her suggestions for changes. Oh, wonderful. I love editors. Oh, yeah. Well, they give some pretty good feedback, right? They do, <laughs> and they want the book to be as good as it can possibly be. And sometimes, you know, you say, I'm not too sure about this, and you listen to them, and sometimes you your idea wins, because they haven't seen it quite like you do. And so, but generally, I, I follow most of their suggestions, because they're very wise. Oh, good to know. <laughs> good to know. 
Um, so what are the status of your other books? Um, you did say that the, uh, sorry, this is our valley, it was in another publishing, correct? It's uh, yes. getting revamped for the new? That's right, a new publisher, because it went out of print. Um, the publisher who did the first two editions in 1989 and then 19, uh, 2003, mm -hmm. uh, the company sold and he died and the company sold and so I thought well it's that's it and then a new publisher Frontenac House who have published several of my aviation books said I want to do this let's bring it back and he was able to get the exact um, uh, book from these little three inch discs that they had he found somebody who could translate oh, or transcribe no onto computer and so we had everything just exactly and so the new chapters are coming out. We're, I wrote a, an epilogue for the new part and the editor, here's again my point of how helpful editors are, she said this should be the beginning, it should be the prologue because my first sentence is, is a river a person? Wow because there are four rivers in the world that have be give, been given status as a person. Oh, really? I yes. did not know that. Isn't that interesting? That is very yes. interesting. <laughs> hmm. So, and then they tried it with the Colorado River. They yeah. tried to take it to court, and that's the where I got the uh, latest information, but it, it that didn't go, but Fair enough. at this point. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. don't know where it might go when then. So does, is the Peace <laughs> River have person status? We'll see. Hmm, that'd be interesting. Yeah. I would, that'd be very interesting to see, actually. Well, I don't know as it is really a band, but uh, we just get together and play together. Uh, so it, anytime uh, when people would come over to visit, we uh, would just pull out the instruments and start playing. Dad would be on the fiddle, um, Joanne, Levine, uh, Joanne on the piano, Levine on the guitar. Now, I was usually pretty small then. So anyway, Clem, uh, he learned to play the piano and, well, he plays lots of things. Yeah, no, whenever we get together, it's just always been music. Uh, there's nothing like music. <laughs> Life wouldn't be the same without music. We start very basic. We do lots of edges and three turns and just basic skills. And then work up into the more interesting stuff, I guess the kids would call it. More of the intricate spins and jumps. So we kind of do a bit of everything with them. I'm doing doubles. So that's like a higher jump and then just like spins and footwork and stuff, yeah. What's the hardest part about that? Um, definitely the double loop. Yeah? Yeah. Because you have to go up on one foot and do two rotations in the air and then land on the same foot. Um, so what about your future plans? Uh, we've had quite a few people, few people in the piece ask about uh, two certain books, The Flying Ghosts and uh, The Keepers of the Mountains. Would you ever see that coming back or is it more Flying of like Ghost a... Flying Ghosts is still in print. Oh, wonderful. It's still active, yes. And uh, the sequel, The Gambler's Daughter, is still active. And so, the but Keeper of the Mountains, I don't know uh, if a publisher decides that it has potential for more sales, uh, perhaps in uh, educational, because it's a lot of uh, Native First Nation educational material in that. And I had great assistance from Moberly Lake people, the, the late chief uh, of the West Moberly, uh, John Doki, 
and at that time chief of the Cree Soto First Nation are at Napoleon. Oh, no way. So everything is valid in the book, and it's a novel, but it's got a lot of uh, true background, Perfect. which is what I love, creative nonfiction. Yeah, it's, it's a hard, uh, play, or hard way to navigate, but to be able to do it must be amazing. Well, I like doing that. Flying Ghosts is the same way. It's all the facts about the building of the Alaska Highway are true, but I wow. created some characters to get a wider audience, in other words, school students. And it worked, because in Fort Nelson, the students, grade six, seven, liked it so much, they had an artist paint the mural on their library wall, which wow. is still there at the R.L. Angus Elementary School. And then they said, what happened to Loretta, one of my secondary characters? So for them, I wrote The Gambler's Daughter. Oh, wow. And dedicated to, to the staff and students. That's amazing. At that school. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, so what are your plans, like career-wise, life-wise? What, life what are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, aside from writing, which will probably never quit as long as I can still hold a pen or tap on the computer or whatever, <laughs> but I, I also took up playing music. Wonderful. When I retired, I worked for 12 years at the Aerospace Museum in Calgary. Oh, wow, okay. Again, associated with aviation. Of course. And uh, then I taught a couple of semesters at Mount Royal University, taught English uh, courses. Uh, but I started uh, playing music again, which I hadn't done for years. Oh, that's always And wonderful. learned to read music again. And now I play the fiddle and the, ma uh, the, the mandolin. Oh, wow. With Prairie Mountain Fiddlers and with another group called Kaol, C-E-O-L, which means song in Irish. That's wonderful. Yeah. Wow, so it's like you've been a very busy lady then. Love it. Oh, that's always good though. Yes. And um, can we speak about your uh, your recent aviation book? Lost? Yep. Uh, Unsolved that Mysteries one right here. of yep. Canadian Aviation? Yeah. Yes. It's an update. It was first, uh, most of the stories were published uh, in 2005 and it went through several printings and then I got the rights back from that publisher and again Frontenac House Publishing said can you call the people or the associates or their colleagues uh, or check records if there have been updates in 10 years because if an aircraft is lost has it been found hmm. so I did and uh, this book came out in 2015 so 10 years later from the first book and it was interesting one of them was a very strange accident. An aircraft had left Lethbridge in 1947, never just disappeared before it was to land in Vancouver. And in 1993, it was discovered Wow! by a hiker who saw this glint of metal and thought, oh, maybe it was a Second World War trainer, but he reported it. And the basically, the skeletons were still in the seats. Wow. And uh, there was a bride and groom aboard, and they knew it was the bride because in those days, a stewardesses, as they call flight attendants, could not be married. So there was only one woman aboard with a wedding ring. Wow. So that was, and I got hold of the woman's sister, and she said, I am so glad my sister's story is not being forgotten. That's amazing. Yeah. That'd, that'd be really cool. It was. I it, rather than people say, why are you you know, rehashing this old story, it's fascinating, it's interesting. One of the stories is a young man flying a restored Harvard, and he had to force land, and he landed in the worst place he could have, uh, called Roderick Island, where the First Nations people who live nearby say whoever goes to Roderick Island never returns. Wow. And they force landed, he and his girlfriend were in the aircraft, they were okay, they took Polaroid pictures of themselves, they have never been found. Ooh, spooky. Ooh. Ooh. I know, it's unsolved. Really? Oh, yeah, that's amazing. It says, it says lost, unsolved yep. mysteries. Makes sense. Um, so where do you find, like, what history do you find is like the most, I guess, like creative to like kind of hash out different stories? People's biographies. Yeah. I love reading them and I love writing them. And that's a thing that writers learn very quickly. You can't write what you can't read. Very true. I don't read Western novels. My husband devours them. <laughs> uh, I don't read romance novels. They're a very popular genre. I don't read them. I can't write them. Oh, of course. So I love biographies. I love young adult adventure stories. Um, Jailbird Kid is yeah. a very dramatic story of a girl turning 15 the day her dad's being released from prison. 
And of course, in young adult novels, the protagonist has to resolve the issue. You can't have adults or mom and dad. Yes. So she has to figure out a way to make her family work. Wow, that's, that's really deep. Yeah. That's good. Um, going into your career, like, where do you think your biggest accomplishment for you is? In the, in the writing, you yeah. mean? Well, uh, when This Was Our Valley uh, won the uh, Alberta Nonfiction Award and the BC Silver for the Roderick Haig Brown Award, I was really pleased. And my co-author, Earl Poland, who is uh, now late, um, he, he was so happy too. And he, he, he was such, such humor. He said he didn't want to be a senior citizen, so he wanted to die at the age of 64. And, but then everything got too interesting with all the awards and phone calls and radio and television stations, so he lasted till he was 74. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that was great fun. And, and just telling the stories, doing readings. I've done readings across the country. I've done write, write, reading and writing workshops with uh, Women in Aviation International in San Diego, Nashville, Dallas, and across Canada, basically. Yeah. Wow. So you've been everywhere and back again? Yeah, yes, and it's wonderful. I haven't given readings in the Maritimes yet, but from Ontario West, yes. Wow, that's amazing. And would you have any tips for young authors trying to kind of dive into your field? Yes, um, I would say definitely have a career that makes you a steady income if, if you're going to, because writing is sporadic and you don't want to say, oh gosh, I sold a short story for 500 bucks, now I can pay the utilities. You know, it, it's just too uh, t stressful. So, like I love having a job and I always worked in re related areas. For example, I worked for BC Hydro on, site, on the Peace Canyon Dam. Um, when, and then later, when I, I called the people at BC Hydro and said, I'm going to write This Was Our Valley, a story about the dams, and they said, oh my gosh. So, but they gave me the material and I knew who to ask. When I, writing the aviation stories, I started here in Hudson's Hope about bush pilots here. We moved to Calgary, and then I started working for the Historical Society of Alberta, and also then the Aerospace Museum. So you can combine your work life with your literary life, and it's good to do that. That's wonderful. Well, thank you, Shirley. I really appreciate you coming in. And uh, if you guys are interested in a creative nonfiction story, definitely give her a look. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Of course. And we'll go up where there is, just up the hill here is where my grandma Marceline lived, where I lived and was raised. I'm trying to figure out today, I think we moved here in 1960. Everybody, we squatted up here. We, nobody owned their properties. Grandma worked very hard raising four of us after she raised all her 
nine kids, and then, they, then she adopted four of us grandchildren. My grandma, for extra dollars, she used to make hides every day. It, all my life I could remember her making hides. As you can see on the one video, um, this is what she did for extra dollars. I was born here by these waters when this world well it's all right. Me and one of my brothers come out to uh I've been raised looking for work. And you can get 80 cents an hour in the bush in, in Alberta, and you get a dollar and a quarter a year, so we just kept coming right. That's why we came here. Never seems to want to slow down. You know, he just, he was, he was actually clearing land when he was 97 years old. Really? He, uh, he broke his last horses to drive when he was just about 90. Yeah, and he was, like I said, he was on his tractor doing some uh, tilling this, this fall. So he's only a few months from 100. <laughs> Always um, the horse logging mm -hmm. and horses. Every, everything you hear about Jim always comes back to horses, one way, shape, or form. <laughs> Any piece of advice that you can give? To what? To, to your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. Well, it was one of the way, like the best, best thing you can do would be be honest, you know, and don't try and do it. You know, rob people or whatever. Honesty is the best way to live. Hard I ever could figure out. It's Linda from Peace FM and I am at Grizzfest and this is Violet Night. How's it going guys? Good. Good. Great on. Great. So how do you like playing in your own uh, backyard? It's, it's more nerve-wracking I would say than touring and uh, shows that aren't so close to home mm -hmm. for me. Yeah, because you, you recognize the faces. It's a lot different when you're playing for a crowd that you don't know but like we know lots of people that are out there right now. It's a lot so. more intimate I would say. Yeah, yeah it's, it's more of a uh, of uh, not another subdivision for me because I'm I'm a, I'm in Alberta so, but it's very fun. Love it here. And do you uh, prefer playing festivals or uh, your own shows? Um, well, this is our first show with Craig. I think a mix of whatever is good. You know, I mean, it depends on where you're playing really, and just it depends on the audience. I think and trying to cater to that audience, be it a festival or be it an, a more intimate show. Uh, personally, I think. Um, Shows that are, are the band's show itself are a lot more intimate and the fans that show up are there because they love the music, whereas at a festival, um, the crowds are amazing, but it's, it's a difference of they're there to see you know five or six bands and not just one or two, so it's a little different of an atmosphere. But the festival atmosphere is, uh, is incredible. Just the people, I love all the, like I honestly love it. I love the food trucks, I love the people. I like just walking around and meeting people. It's always such a cool thing to just mingle and... Um, it's a really awesome experience for us. So. We got the guys behind us eating the kebabs. I mean, the yeah, fruit kebabs. Wow. Yeah, so. yeah wow. you could zoom in on them. <laughs> they are taking, those are our boys. They played uh, guitar and bass for us at this show, and they are taking full advantage of all the free food and everything in our trailer. And <laughs> we do, we love them. Loading up their pockets. Have, yeah, uh, have like garbage bags full of all the stuff we don't take. Well, like, I brought this with me. We just get sued because they steal that kiss cup. <laughs> there's, a, there's a Gene Simmons cup in our trailer, actually. It's really cool. It's, uh, I think it was supposed to be an Icons trailer, the Kiss cover band, but they put it in ours instead. So we'll take cool. it. We'll take it. It's a win with pride. And what's next for Violet Night? Um, this is our final show. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> we're uh, <laughs> quitting while we're on top. Yeah, we um, we've reached the pinnacle as a band, and I think that it's time to disband. We hate each other. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we're uh, we're looking to move to Toronto. We've got a new record coming out. Um, 
You know, we keep saying we were hoping on August, and it's August, and I think half of it's done. We've been working on it since March, so I feel like I'm optimistic for November that it'll come out. But we really want to put that out. Um, we've, we're in the works to have a really special guest vocalist on the album that I'm not going to say who it is, uh, but if if uh, eventually it will come out, I'm sure. Yeah, we don't um, want to rush it. We want it to be perfect. Yeah, good. The first album, we we want it to be. Yeah, uh, on par with the albums that we listen to, I guess. Like a, like a masterpiece, so to speak. Something that front to back can capture an audience and, you know, move you through different emotions and and make you feel different things. I think that's what we've always aspired to do is to create something that people um, feel safe in. I guess it's it's an atmosphere. You know, it's not just a band. It's a it's a feeling. Violet Night. That's what I always say because it really rings true. I think. Science World is a charitable organization and our entire mission is to engage British Columbians across the province in different kinds of science. So the On the Road program is internally funded and it's an outreach program to reach schools in British Columbia that may not get the chance to take a field trip to Science World um, very often or that might not get to visit at all. So depending on the size of the school, we have a primary show for kindergarten to grade threes, which is about the scientific process. It's called How to Science. We have an intermediate show called Earth, Wind and Science, which is about the weather. And then we have an entire school show for smaller schools called Fantastic Forces, which talks all about forces such as push and pull, lift and friction. 